All right, first of all, let me introduce our guests tonight. Bob and Kathy Knight um, have joined us. They have been training dogs together, I love that, for nearly 50 years. And they've together earned obedience trial championships on seven standard schnauzers, uh, most of whom were also confirmation champions. They've also owned and put titles on, on Irish Setter, Miniature Schnauzer, St. Bernard, and Border Terriers. Prior to retiring and becoming AKC judges, they operated a large boarding and grooming and training business. And during that time, they trained and showed dogs for some of their clients, which include uh, one golden retriever I saw, guys. Okay, a Bouvier, <laughs> Belgian Sheepdog, Standard Schnauzer, Welsh Terriers. I'm, I, I'm thinking the only group that was missing was the toy group. Um, anyway, they became approved to judge all the AKC obedience classes in 2009, and they told me that we are both enjoying and giving back to the sport we've enjoyed for so many years. So I know that if you could, you'd clap and give them a warm welcome and say, hi, Bob and Kathy, we're glad to have you. So guys, just uh, speak for a minute. I want to make sure that you, they can see you when you do that. Just say hello. Okay, hello to everybody, and thank you, Connie, for doing this. All right, there you go. So now we're applauding. It's going to be fun. All right, so here's, here's what I thought we would do tonight, gang. I thought we would start with just talking about some of the changes that have taken place because we're showing in uh, what, what the rules now are during COVID-19. So uh, I know that they've done some judging, and so I was hoping that they would start by just giving us a little, a little bit of a, a their impression, what it's like when they're judging, and and maybe you guys could just go through a um, few things about in in kind of in order: novice, open, utility. What what are you noticing? Right. What what can you tell us about that? Right. Well, different clubs are doing different things. We've done some judging and we've done exhibiting in this environment. Uh, AKC has also put out a lot of different changes that uh, go with the the COVID, but typically a club is asking you to sign a COVID waiver, which is attached to your entry, um, basically relieving them of liability should you get ill. When you enter the building, the AKC prefers one door for entrance, one for exit. Some clubs are doing temperature checks as you come in the door, some are not. Most municipalities are requiring, requiring masks while you're in an environment. So we are wearing masks in the building. Most clubs are saying masks can be removed while you're being judged. Judge can decide whether or not they want to wear the mask while they're judging you. So people have to practice both ways with the judge having a mask and without. Uh, a judge typically is staying six to eight feet away from you. So mask is not required. No food or drink is sold at any event going on right now because of COVID. You have to bring your own chair. The building is being disinfected after every day um, that the trial's gone on. So safety is very important to most of the clubs. And so far, it seems to be working. As far as each class goes, uh, novice is interesting. We're typically doing that with no stewards at all. Hosts are not there anymore. Clubs have used chairs, stools, uh, cones, pylons, whatever you want to refer to them as for the figure eight. AKC says you can leave them in the ring or remove them after every exhibitor. I have not seen them removed yet. They're in the ring all the time. So something you need to practice with. Um, when your leash is removed for after your figure eight, most clubs are having a stand where you put your leash, which you'll also go get it for the sit and get your leash exercise. You put it on that stand yourself, continue on with the rest of your exercises, set and get your leash. You get the leash, you leave, and a steward will come in and disinfect that table where your leash was set. I have seen some clubs, a steward will come out with a tray. You place the leash on the tray, they leave. Again, the tray is disinfected. Some of these procedures are at the judge's disc discretion. Obviously, in the ring, the final decision is what the judge wants. Of course, they, they tend to try and work with the club. So if, if a judge wants a tree in the ring or outside the ring for open, uh, if they want to use trays, it's the, the judge really has the final decision on that. 
Okay. Um, on this group exercises, AKC has said that we should be eight feet apart instead of six feet apart on our group exercises. Whether that's a big deal or not, I don't know, but that's what we're doing. In open, again, the cones are used for the figure eight. Dumbbell is placed on a, tr on a table, typically outside the ring. The exhibitor goes to get their own dumbbell before they do the retrieve exercises. It's placed back there as many times, open B, whatever routine you're doing that you have to go back and forth and get it. But typically what the goal is, is no one is touching your equipment, leash or dumbbell in open. So, and your, your cones are again there for figure eights. Can I ask you a question about that? So sure. are people telling their dogs to sit and stay while they go get the dumbbell or are they taking the dogs with them or both? That's, it's your option and they're doing both. Yeah. And you know, you know your dog, you wanna take him with you to yeah, do my, that? My, my preference is for the novice is the handler and the dog go over to the tree and set the leash. Basically because I don't want dog and handler 20, 30 feet away <laughs> from each other <laughs> before they get back. <laughs> And of course, after in, you know, everything is disinfected. Utility, obviously you've got to have stewards. There's no way you can run that ring without help. Um, what I have mostly seen is a tray that the two articles you're going to use are placed on with tongs. The steward goes out and places the articles with tongs or sometimes wearing disposable gloves. Okay. Then uh, after the articles are done, that steward will remove those gloves, new pair of gloves for the next dog, or just disinfect the tongs that they use to place. We move on to the directed retrieve. The gloves are placed again with tongs by the steward or disposable gloves. So nobody is touching anything that belongs to anybody else. There has been some instances where the stewards are using their hands on the articles without gloves and after every run they disinfect disinfect their hands either with alcohol or hand sanitizer or hand, uh, some form of hand sanitizer one of the things I specify if that's the way they choose to do it is you make sure your hands are completely dry before you handle the next dog's articles. Now, don't want residue being carried over, you know, bad enough with the coronavirus, but you don't want dogs kind of shying away from some chemical smell on the articles. So far, I haven't seen any of that. The dogs don't seem to they don't react to it at all. Yeah, they don't seem to mind, but you don't want someone who's just sprayed their hands with disinfectant they're still slightly damp to go out there and touch them because now the articles are contaminated with the disinfectant. So when you get to the trial, your, your armband is at a separate table. You go check in, get your armband. There's no steward there to help you at your ring table. You, uh, the last trials we were at, they had individual envelopes with your armband and your rubber band in it with your name on it. Pass those out at the table. At the end of the day, when the awards are given out, we call the everybody back in who's qualified, give out your, call up your first four placements standing six feet apart. They get no ribbon. There's a ribbon table. You go collect your own. On picking up your armband. It's at a separate table. They've done a, a number of things. The table also will have the run order at one trial and you check yourself off. Another trial, you pick up your armband, but then you need to go to the ring and check yourself in. So just because you picked up your armband all by yourself doesn't mean you're checked in. It just- Depends how the club chooses to do it. None of it is it's, difficult to deal with. No, and, and each club chooses how they wanna do it, and it's as little personal contact as we can get by with. I'm guessing that a lot of these rules could become permanent. I, I mean, I it, think it's in, in a way, it sounds like we're making it a little bit easier for everybody involved. 
I certainly like the cones or chairs or stools for figure eight that moves everything along rather than standing there and saying, post please, <laughs> <laughs> which we might still, still do once in a while, but um, it, well, figure eight. I, I would love to see that stay permanent, but we'll see what happens. And then the uh, pandemic going on that a lot of it's overkill that we probably don't want to do down the road when we aren't worrying about a serious infection, like taking your rubber gloves off and replacing them with every dog. But right now it seems like it would. And I, and I think it makes people comfortable to enter and compete. You know, gives people some peace of mind. And so if they can get out and do what they love to do and feel like they're going to be safe when they do it, isn't that wonderful? Yes, I'd, I'd rather have overkill than then feel like it wasn't handled as well. It sounds like they're doing a really good job in your area. Yep. Florida has trials almost every weekend and the AKC has been very good about approving trials really late on. And we were in St. Petersburg last weekend showing and in two weeks we're judging there. They're having another trial. Great. Which is unheard of for the AKC, but they're letting it happen. So great. Yep. Great. Okay, well, let's go on. Uh, when, when we're just talking about now judging in general, I would like for you to let, again, we'll start with novice. You guys have judged a ton of shows. Can you talk to me about the one or two most common handler errors that you see people make in novice or beginner novice that just make you go, oh. <laughs> I, I typically think um, handlers get the idea that if they give an extra command on healing, they're done. So I think one of the biggest errors I see is not using an extra command to save a qualifying score. Your dog's far out of heel position. Don't stand and look at him. Look back at him. <laughs> wait for him. Tell him to get there. It's only going to cost you points. So um, I, I would say that's one of the biggies. And then this carries over into every class, no matter novice, open, or utility, keeping your dog with you and their attention between exercises. You are not being judged. That's your time to do what you need to do to get your dog with you and get a good setup for your next exercise. It follows in the same vein, getting your dog in heel position and ready to go for the next exercise. The worst thing in the world is to line up for heel position and the handler and the dog are turning around and around and around and minutes are going by. Uh, when you walk into the ring for the very first time and you go through this exercise of not being able to say heel, the dog lines up and gets in heel position, you're telling the judge before anything has started, this isn't going to be pretty. Well, there's a point where it takes too long. We've got to We've got a mark uh, uh, under, under misbehavior. The dog's not lining up to get ready to go. And if I have 40 dogs to judge, I'm going to start getting a little annoyed <laughs> because I got 39 other dogs waiting their turn and I've got to stand out here all day waiting for that. Okay, good, good to know. Um, I, I can't, I like I've to... never seen you annoyed, Bob, so I'm, I'm struggling with that, but if you say so. <laughs> well, I think handlers need to consider moving from exercise to exercise as a unscored exercise. Train it. Train your dog to move from here to there, from healing to the dumbbell, whatever, as an exercise. Don't lose their attention. Make sure they move with you. Coming in and setting up is important. I'm, I'm, I'm loving it because I, they, these guys have heard me talk about teaching a dog to find heel position so much. I, I wonder if they're tired of it. And so I'm just thinking, <laughs> well, now, they just I heard say, it again. <laughs> I, now I can say, remember what Bob and Kathy said, they got to be able to find heel position. Well, one of the, one of the things that you see in judging is when you're encountering that situation is the people are using every command but heel. It's come on or they're doing the food thing or <laughs> they're not using the simple command they hopefully have been teaching their dog. Heel. Or whatever okay. they say. Or whatever they say. Line up, whatever. 
Um, well, here's a question that came in about novice. Uh, it, uh, this person wrote in, we work hard to get our dogs to pay attention on the healing. However, I believe it's true that a dog won't lose any points if he's not healing with attention. Is that true? And, and what are you looking for if a dog's not paying attention? If you're referring to attention as head up and looking at the okay, handler, okay. yeah, that that um, I I have it right there in the rule books on page 32, section 18. The head to the shoulders in line with the left hip is heel position. There is no mention of head up, so we are not scoring whether the head is up looking at the handler. We are scoring head to the shoulders in line with the left hip. But I will add to that, <laughs> if the dog is looking at the handler, pretty sure you're going to get better healing than a dog that is not. I don't see how a dog can give you perfect healing if they're not paying attention. Fair enough. Well, there is something in the rules about attitude, and that was the next question I got, was how important is attitude, and have you ever deducted points for a, what I think the rules say is a lack of willingness or enjoyment? Right. Or do you assume that most dogs that are not enjoying it are probably going to make a bigger mistake and you don't have to deduct for it? Exactly. Well, that yeah, we have on page 28, section 2, standard of perfection. <laughs> The judge's picture of perfection must be within the rules, but it does state, as you said, utmost willingness and enjoyment and precision. Now we can't read into that anything else. However, um, if, a, if, I mean, every breed can show willingness. You don't have to be wagging your tail and wiggling all over to be willing. But if you're walking, obviously that's not willing. You mean slowly walking yes. as opposed yes. to, okay. Yes, if I, if I see a dog, I called him on a recall and he's just plodding in, that's not enjoyment and willingness. So yes, you do duck I, points. I would put it in the same category as our attention in that you're gonna see errors happen when there's a lack of willingness, lack of attention. They're gonna show up in, in the performance itself. So you don't really have to mark a dog because he doesn't look like he's having a good time. If they're not having a good time, if they're walking, you know, obviously walking is a, is, can be a substantial, the, 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 the errors will pop up with that. Okay, well, there is another question though about noticeable change of pace. This particular question was, my dog paces naturally. And some judges take points away when she paces in on a recall or paces in on a retrieve. I know we're still talking about novice. And do I have to try to get a dog who doesn't naturally trot to trot in order for judges to say that that meets the speed requirement? A dog who is not very structurally sound can move quickly at a very fast pace. That pacing is basically both legs on each side going at the same time. It can be done showing willingness and quickly. So with that, with that pace though, at some point we have to distinguish, is it fast enough to warrant willingness or is it just, oh, I'll get there but it's in the form of a pace. We have to make that distinction. Do I mark it for slow or do I accept even though it's a pace? We can okay. accept a pace as long as it's done quickly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, fair enough. Now, back to the noticeable change of pace though. Somebody sent in a question that said, can you describe what it looks like to you? Do both the dog and the handler have to have a noticeable change of pace. Yes. Yes, they do. And I can tell you which, where, where it says that too. The best, best description is in the rules, page 38, section five. Fast means the handler must run and the handler and the dog must move forward at a noticeably accelerated speed. 
okay? So dog and handler must move at an accelerated speed. Page 39, section six, uh, minors or substantial will be deducted for a dog or a handler that doesn't change pace. And I use an analogy in my notes of what's, what's the difference? Well, let's say I'm out for a walk in the park and I'm just strolling along, looking at the leaves, not paying any attention, just strolling along. Okay, that's a slow pace. If I'm out there trying to get from point A to point B as fast as I can go or jogging, that's an accelerated speed. So think about that in your mind as far as strolling versus jogging. I try in the book for a noticeable change of pace. Okay, it doesn't have to be a long stretch. Uh, and you got to realize uh, the average age of people in obedience <laughs> They don't run too well anymore. <laughs> so we kind of got to get a little lenient. Just show me a change. Both dog and we, we We appreciate your generosity. <laughs> um, somebody sent in a question that I th thought was interesting. Back to when you were talking about being able to get the dog into heel position. They said, uh, is it better if I, if I arrive at the next location for the next exercise, is it better to leave my dog alone if they're a little crooked than to continue to fiddle if they're crooked? Yes, by all yeah. means. If you can fiddle, fiddle quickly. Okay, good. <laughs> but if you can't, then leave them a little crooked. We're not judging that. At that, if, if you leave your dog a little bit crooked on a recall, it's not scored. Okay. So you're much better off than doing those spins and spins and trying to straighten that up. Okay. Agreed. All right. Yeah. All right. Let's um. Let's go to graduate novice and open. Um, is there a handler error that comes to mind that we need to be aware of? Well, I witnessed one today uh, when I was putting people through that you don't think about a lot. The last exercise in both those classes, stand and get your leash. You will occasionally see somebody who reaches over the gate to get their leash. You must leave the ring, you must leave the ring, get your leash, come back in and wait until you're told to return to your dog. And when you come back in, step into the ring, not at the gate, okay? So simple thing, but, and it's new to a lot of people. So, but you need to actually leave the ring, not do the reach over, and come back in and wait till you're told to go back in. Here's one item I see a lot, and it, it falls back into novice on the recall. Handler leaves dog, goes the other end of the ring, leaves about that much space for the dog to finish. Anytime you're going to retrieve a recall where the dog's got to finish, give yourself three or four feet so the dog isn't worried about the gate behind him. Okay. And you see it a lot. Okay. I, I tell people after an exercise when their dog can't get a straight finish because there's no room, I, I tell them, next time, give your dog some room to finish. Three or four feet from the gate is fine. Okay. Well, that's generous. And I don't think everybody's quite that generous when we make that <laughs> mistake. <laughs> I mean, to tell me. They might tell oh, me after oh. the class was over. Oh, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. You, you understand what I'm saying? That, that right. at, least you're, at least you're giving people a hint. Like, don't do that again. <laughs> well, I'm, tr I'm, I'm trying to decide which are the best four dogs. And when you see handlers make errors that are not helping their dog at all, you want to make a comment about it. You, you can do better. <laughs> Well, I, no, I appreciate that. Uh, Probably something I see in open on the broad jump is a uh, handler. The dog, you're supposed to turn while the dog is in the air. We see an awful lot of early turns and late turns on the broad jump. And the word pivot means turn in place. And okay. you, see an, you see an awful lot of, that's not a turn in place. That was an actual step. So, okay. Those are something that I, I see in open. 
that happens. And other than, you know, setting up between exercises, the same, same, same thing that we talked about in novice. Okay. What do you think is the most failed exercise in open now? Now, I mean, now meaning the stays are gone. Are, are people doing pretty well with command discrimination? Do you think it's the drop on recall? Yeah, I think command discrimination is, has gone pretty well. Yeah, I would say drop on recall is probably the most failed exercise with command discrimination the second. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. And, and are they failing the drop by not dropping or failing the drop by anticipating the drop? Mostly not dropping. Not dropping. Open not A dropping. dogs mostly not dropping. Okay. What you about the open B dog? You'll get an occasional anticipation, but it's mostly drops that they're flunking on the recall. And, okay. and B dogs, um, command discrimination to me is much harder in open B than it is in open A because oh, yeah. open A it's the same every time. In open B, it's all jumbled up. So you don't know, I mean, you know what you're gonna do when you get there. But I would say for open B dogs, command discrimination is probably the most failed exercise right now. Wow. And, uh, he, oh, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, just, just has to do with the dog having to pay a lot of attention to which signal it's gonna be and being consistent with it. Hey, I think this is a good question. It just came in. Uh, they said in open, and I'm assuming with the new rules, how did your leash get outside of the ring? Did you place it outside the ring? Or did the steward, or is the, the tree outside the ring? How did it get outside the ring? Because you had to come in on ring, on leash, right? Right, right. You, you come can, in on leash. But you just step into the ring, and the, the tree or the chair is right on the other side of the ring, and you have a handler just drop it. That's one where you can reach outside the ring and deposit it. You can't do that to get it back, but you can do it to give it up. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. I, I think, really, you know, we're nervous. You, people get nervous. That's the kind of thing that you think, well, I reached over to put it down. Why can't yeah. I reach over to pick it up, right? Yeah. Nope. Nope. Sure. Oh, good question. Oh, it is. Question about the drop-on recall. How much time do you think is appropriate for the drop on recall between the signal and the drop? I can I just add my own kind of thoughts to that is that I it all it almost to me looks better when you give a signal because your signal lasts longer. When you say down, the dog could take two or three steps and it looks worse than if you gave a signal to drop because your signal takes time and it took the time to the dog some time. But, but how, do you, how do you go about judging that? Looking for response from the dog. How do they respond to the signal? They may slide or travel a little, but if they're responding going down, that's what I'm looking for is how, how quickly do they respond? If they're a once they've responded and maybe they don't like slamming their elbows down on the ground, I don't mark that. I'm okay. looking at the reaction of the dog to the signal. If he whether, reacts- Whether verbal or- Yeah, wh wh whatever one, I wanna see the dog react instantly, not travel several steps before, oh, okay, I guess I'll go down. If he's in the action of going down, as soon as the command, whether it be voice or hand, given, that's fine. It may take him a little bit to get there. Okay, But Fair that's enough. fine. Now, I, I had quite a few uh, questions that are kind of on the same vein. This one says, I get pretty nervous, <laughs> don't we all? Yeah. With past dogs, I feel like I have rushed through the exercise and couldn't even remember how we did. I really would like to enjoy every second of this journey and not feel so rushed. I'll be starting an open soon. Do you think that taking time for a few deep breaths and taking a few seconds between exercise will be acceptable by most judges? I, I absolutely think so, um, and and I would I wrote down what I would suggest is you set up for your next exercise. The judge says to you, "Are you ready? Take your breaths before you respond." You set up, take your deep breaths. Are you ready? Breath, yes. So just take your time. I I just I said to somebody last weekend who is in utility A, someone that we've been working with. And I, I reminded her when she went in the ring, you paid for this time. It's your time. Don't let the judge push you and make you move quicker 
Do things faster than you want to do. Make sure you're ready. You're, you're nervous. You're in, well, whatever class and you're getting a leg. So just, it's your $29 or whatever. But don't, don't sit there <laughs> taking breaths and letting your dog run around no, your legs. No, but... <laughs> well, I was just going to say that's very interesting because you said, you know, please get to the next place. Don't be wandering around the ring. But when you get there, it's okay if you take your time. That's well, not no, really. No, don't is. take, just take your sweet old time. Take a few breaths and I'll say, are you ready? If I see you hyperventilating, I'm going to slow down because I know you're, and one of the things we tell people who get overly nervous or excited in the ring, take each exercise one at a time. Don't worry about what's going coming up next. Or Do, what just happened. Or what just happened. You got a lousy front or put no it, finish or put whatever. It away. Put it Think away. of that exercise. But when, particularly when you're going for legs and stuff, just go think of the exercise you're working and that's it. When you're done, then start thinking about the next exercise. Is it ever okay to tell a judge you're not ready? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay. And it's happened plenty. Your, your dog has got his head on backwards and you're trying to do a go out. Are you ready? Well, no. <laughs> and you don't have to say it like that, but just say no and do what you need to do to get that dog's attention. Is it okay to say no because you need to take a deep breath? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I okay. mean, yeah. yeah. I actually, as an, a utility A person is getting near the end and they're qualifying, you can see the anxiety building in that individual. I don't, and I, I will go up to someone and say, breathe for me, please. Yeah. And, <laughs> and you, you know, you get a giggle and it's okay. And take your time and relax. Take your time, set up, make sure you're ready. Along the same lines, another open handler wrote in, clean handling is very challenging, at least for me. At what point do you score body movement? I feel like my, my bad or poor body movement is often unintentional because I'm nervous. Uh, when do you see it as an extra command? When the extra command aids the dog. Okay. Now... Now, if I, if I see someone coming in and their dog's coming in a little crooked and I see him trying to tilt east and the dog finds the front, I'm marking that because it's aiding the dog. Okay. And even if the dog ends up straight, they're going to get marked for a crooked front. And I, and I, because of the body movement. Because of the body movement. Now, I'll, I make a lot of notations on my score sheet. So if I ticked, a half point off a front and I did it because of the handlers tipping windmills, I'm going to put H E for handler error. So I, you know, if they come back to me, I can explain to them what they were doing. Okay. Another, another example of that would be, okay, recalls. And I think all of us have seen this. Someone calls the dog and from the minute they give that call command, their head begins to follow in with the dog until he's right there in front. That to me is scorable. Now, if the dog is coming in and is, when he's there, you drop your head to look at a front, that's okay. But if you're gonna make eye contact with your dog and drop your head a little bit all the way in, that's extra body. That okay, is but would you agree or disagree? It is normal to watch the dog that we're showing. Oh yeah. But, you can but I can do it without extreme motion. I think that's Absolutely. what you're telling me. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it stands out when you sort that. It's, okay. it, it's easy to pick up. Okay, I think you might have answered this question, but let, let's just make sure. This person wrote in, my dog is incredibly excitable. So in between exercises, if I tell him to sit and stay, and I go to the steward to get the dumbbell, and we're, you know, we don't necessarily have to talk about COVID, but if I step away from the dog to do something, and he, let's say he moves, or he stands up, or he scooches, the judge heard me say sit, stay. Is that points off? No. No, you're not being judged between exercises. So if the dog comes, decides to come with you after you've told him to stay, oh, well, just make sure that he's under control. Okay. You can't, you can't have him flying around the ring or, you know, dancing around. But um, as long as he's under control, not points off. Okay. Um, somebody asked 
uh, all right, what happens after you've said, no, I'm not ready? How do you reboot? <laughs> do you then look at the judge like, okay, I'm ready now? Or what, what, well, how do we get past you, that? If you say, no, I'm not ready, you better be doing something that looks like you're trying to get ready. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> like, you know, if, if you're, if you're trying to oxygenate, oxygenate your lungs, I understand. <laughs> But if you're just fiddling around with your dog, I'm going to say, are you ready again? And if I get another delay, I might mark that. Again, um, most, of the, most of these items are, are small deductions, half points and stuff like that. Okay. I've got some questions coming in, but we're going to get through the ones that were sent in first, and then we'll see how many others okay. that we can get to. Sure. In utility couple of handler errors that you see that you want to make sure we're aware of? Not pivoting in place. Are you talking about the glove exercise? Glove and articles. Okay. Yeah, both both are pivots that are, are supposed to occupy the same ter territory. Even the turn <laughs> on the directed jumping, people can step out of position. Okay. You can turn, turn and face your glove, but the, it doesn't say you can turn and step toward your dog or something like that. Okay. One of, the big, one of the big items I see in A, occasionally see it in the B classes too, on the stand signal, people will signal their dog to stand and then just abruptly bang, stop. And it's almost a guaranteed forge stand. Okay. What I like to see, and it's handling, signal step and a half so that you slow down with the dog and you both end up in heel position. And I see that a lot. Now again, before it sit on a stand, it's not a big point loss, but it's so easily handled so it isn't a forge. There's a couple times in utility that your commands are longer than any other command we ever get. Stand your dog is one and call your dog to heal. In other words, when you say call your dog to heal, yeah. you're, I, I can wait till you get the whole sentence out before I respond, right? If that's what you want to do, sure. <laughs> okay, and stand your dog. I don't have to be telling him to stop or stopping while you're saying stand your. No. I can wait until you say the whole thing, right? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. It's, you know, it's kind of like turns and about turns and healing. We're not expecting you to do it at the, on the next step. If okay. I say about turn, two or three steps before you initiate your turn is fine with me. I mean, it's, you got to work with your dog. Okay. And then in utility, there were a couple questions that uh, were involved with when we're giving a signal and a verbal. Directed jumping. I'm putting my arm up to tell the dog to jump. Glove exercise. I'm putting my hand down to give the dog the, you know, to send him maybe on the go out, I might be giving him a signal as I'm sending him. Uh, the question was about, is there a deduction for the dog moving before the verbal? So if I start to move my hand on the directed jumping and the dog takes off, is there a deduction if he's moving before I get the jump command out? Not on my score sheet. Um, I would say on directed jumping, if you're a good handler, if your dog is gone on the hand signal, you just keep your mouth shut. Okay. There'll be no, there'll be no question. There on the to... glove, you cannot do that. That's the one and only exercise in obedience where you must give a hand and voice. Okay. So you must on the glove. Now, it, there used to be a rule, you and I have been doing this long enough, that if you gave a signal only on one jump, on directed jumping, you had to give a signal only on the second jump. No. Doesn't apply. No. You can give a verbal for one of the jumps, and if you think the dog's taking off the right direction because you flinched on the other one, just give the signal and keep your mouth shut. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, I hope I'll, you all I'll got throw, that. I'll throw a little historic thing in here. <laughs> it used to be in Canada, if you gave a signal to jump, you could not use the, uh, use the signal. You could not use the dog's name. It had to be pup. <laughs> now, I'm not sure that rule's in existence anymore, but when we used to run it back and forth across the border, we had to remind ourselves to, you know, 
don't use the dog's name. And I'll tell you one odd one that I did judge. Uh, this person was a herding person. When I told them to do the jump on the left, they used their right arm. But the dog took the right jump, so he qualified. Yes. Yeah. yes. But let me tell you, it gave me a double take. <laughs> <laughs> These are some more general questions. Uh, somebody wrote in, do you think most judges want the competitors to qualify? Because over the years, I've experienced judges that take time to say, you've NQ'd or you've qualified. I believe, by the way, it said that they were truly sorry when I NQ'd. And after the trial, they were glad to review what I should have done. I think most judges want you to qualify. I think there's a few that consider a NQ a notch on their pistol. But I think most judges want you to qualify. I agree. And I, and I think if, if you didn't qualify because of a handler mistake, I think most judges are more than happy to talk to you about that to, so that it doesn't happen again. In fact, I know that I have said to somebody in a beginner class or something like that, sorry about that. You shouldn't have done that. And here's what you need to do tomorrow. Okay. And so that was the next question, I think. You know, when I, somebody wrote in, when I start a new dog, I would like to ask the judges about my performance, especially the healing. And I'm not asking why did I lose points, but is this an appropriate question? And when is the right time to ask the judge that question? Actually, the AKC encourages us to talk to handlers. There's a section in there. I won't quote it for you again on my page and section that I have written down. But we are encouraged to talk to exhibitors that come up to us and ask about their score. And I think most judges are more than happy to get out your sheet, their worksheet, and go over with you what they saw. Um, the only thing that I, I think the next question is, whether you disagree with that score or not, always do it politely and accept whatever is told to you politely. A judge is never to argue with an exhibitor and you, know, you should never get into a verbal argument with one another. The best time to do it is when the class is over or if the judge is running terribly behind in their assignment, you may have to wait till the end of the trial. Okay. But I think most judges are more than happy to go over a sheet with you. Yeah. I say to a judge, I disagree with your assessment or your scoring. Just don't do it. You're in a losing battle to start with. If you want to find out what they mark you for, and then when you get home, you want to look in the rule book, that's fine. But I would never say to a judge, well, I just don't agree with you. At that point, I mean, the conversation should be over with it. The AKC tells us the conversation should be over. If you do find an error in a score, obviously math errors are made on occasion. Take it, you bring it to the judge, the steward, or the superintendent, or the trial secretary, because it should be corrected before the day is over. I love this question. What can we do to show that we appreciate all the judges as they do work so hard that they know that we appreciate them and, and thank them for doing the best job that they can? That was a very nice question. Very nice question. <laughs> um, and, and all I can say is to sincerely thank a judge, thank your stewards, thank the club that's putting on the event. Um, we all enjoy praise. So, you know, a, a big thank you is, is, Enough. People, when they're disgruntled, they write the AKC. If you have shown under a judge you think is wonderful, write the AKC. Tell them. The other thing is bring chocolate and wine. <laughs> <laughs> I knew we weren't going to get past that without you bringing that up. Uh, here was an interesting question, guys. Between exercises, some people ask their dogs to do spins to relieve stress. But I've see, seen some judges um, deduct points for that, saying that it is tr a training tool. What are your thoughts? I don't object to it if it doesn't delay the class, doesn't delay judging. If I have to stand there and watch you spin, watch you spin <laughs> when we're set up in position to go, I'm going to say, are you ready? And if they don't get the hint, <laughs> but and I'll mark, I will mark it. 
But as long as they're moving to where they should be going and they're not slowing things down, making the judge wait, no problem. I have no problem with it. Okay. In utility, at what point does a dog shaking the glove become a deduction? Well, the glove is scored by the pickup. And as soon as he picks it up and shakes it, it's points off. There's, there's no shake that's allowed. Okay. Maybe a little one. <laughs> a little one? Right. If, you, if I have a dog that shakes it's... the glove, I'm showing to you, Bob, but not to your wife. Well, I always have an answer for the handler when there's a real hard shake <laughs> coming back to the handler. I'm saying, sure glad it's not a duck. <laughs> Um, so same as it, I mean, same. You can look at it like a dumbbell. I mean, what, how much yeah. chewing is allowed? <laughs> you know, mouthing is some, scored. Pull the glove or the dumbbell back on their molars for a good cat. I mean, for a good hold, that's okay. Bob, somebody wrote in that they're showing to you on Labor Day, and they just want to know what kind of wine they should bring. <laughs> White and dry. Okay. <laughs> Before we're done, I know that you guys get in some crazy scenarios when you're judging. Things come up that you think, oh my, what, what is the, the section in the chapter for that? <laughs> and I just wondered if you had some you'd like to share with us because I, the crazy stuff does happen. You want me to tell my article story first? Of, of I, do you tell us, uh, we're going to love the stories no matter what they are, so I'd love for you okay. to share. Okay, well, one, one that I found very, very memorable. I knew the dog was getting a leg, even though it's a utility B class, and it was a quick, fast, speedy working little dog. Last exercise, articles, and that little dog zipped out there, got the right one, brought it back, everything's perfect. Second article, same thing, he's out to that pile lightning fast, grabs the right article, sitting in front of his owner, and I say, take it. Re Handler reached down, has the article in his hand, and before anything else can happen, the little dog is back in the pile. I left the handler, he's out there searching again. The handler is, looks to see, I got the right one with this look on his face like, now what? And I'm looking, watching this poor little guy search. He's never going to find it. And so I said, finish your dog. The handler said, heal. And he did. He came out of the pile and came, came out of the pile and did a perfect finish. Points so, off. Points off. Wait, points, points off, but a new UD. <laughs> and we were all smiling. <laughs> and the crowd cheered. <laughs> Here's an example of a judge who wants as many handlers as possible to qualify. Dog takes the jump, or let's say the broad jump. Dog takes the broad jump, comes in, maybe crooked, maybe straight. Handler says, or the judge says to the handler, finish your dog. The dog gets halfway around and starts wandering off. To me, the judge that wants you to qualify is going to say, exercise finish and score you for a no finish but you passed and you know it, it's our job to help you pass but that's um on a, on a lot of the stuff you think what was the principal part of the exercise taking the jump getting close enough for a friend at that point the dog has qualified why let him wander around the ring and decide oh well he's kind of out of control now and a, lo a lot of times people think a dog ha leaving the ring has to be an NQ. It does not. If I'm giving you a fast, normal about turn and the gate is near and that dog leaves the ring and the handler says, heel, and he's back in heel position, it's points off, but you do not fail. Oh. You said the same with a dumbbell retrieve? Because I've seen a lot of dogs fail for leaving the ring to get a dumbbell. If you push, if the dog pushes that dumbbell under the gate, jumps the gate, gets the dumbbell, jumps back in, and there's no extra command, he's passed. Yeah, I mean, you're gonna lose points for pushing it out there. You're gonna lose points for a delay on the comeback, but you're gonna pass. Now, if the handler calls him back in, no pass. Hmm, I wanna make sure I'm showing to you if that ever happens. <laughs> 
Chuck, you guys told me a great story about utility articles, about a dog, a, something that happened on a pivot. Yes. The, or did you, were you judging or did you just see that? We were watching it. We were watching it. We were ex exhibiting. The exhibitor was doing a turn and sit to the article pile. The exhibitor pivoted, but the dog did not. Okay, so, so now the, the handler's facing the pile, but the dog's facing the other way. Yep, watching the dumbbell being thrown in the ring behind her, basically. <laughs> okay. So the handler told the dog to heal again and sent it to the pile. So immediately everyone outside the ring is, did she flunk, did she flunk? So we got the book and on the article, you do not. She can reposition on the article. The only way you can anticipate the send. the send from a sit or sit when you should have been sending direct. So she didn't have to send the dog while it was facing the other way. She actually could give a second heel command. Could have. could have sent it if she wanted to do that and say, find it from there and the dog went out to the pile. That's fine. Might have saved a point or two <laughs> on the next command. But she, she could give the dog a second heel command to do the pivot and then send the dog to the pile. Based on the rules, it's qualifying. And it's perfectly spelled out in the re regulation. Well, now, when she pivoted and the dog didn't pivot, did she give a second command? Well, sure, because the judge says turn and send. So he's already told you to turn and send. So yeah. she said heal twice and then right. sent the dog. Right. Well, that one, I would have got that one wrong. <laughs> well, here's the thing. At first, several of us were thinking in the vein of the glove. Once you've pivoted, you cannot reposition. Any reposition or extra command is an NQ. On the directed retreat. Okay. It specifically says that on the directed retreat. But well, we all ran to the rule because we thought, <laughs> wow, that's weird. What do we do with this? And it's, 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 Spells it out. There's no doubt. So on a glove, it, if she if the same thing had happened on the glove, let's just say the dog hadn't moved. Right now she's facing glove two. The dog's facing the wrong way. If she had given the signal to the glove and sent the dog, and he had just turned around and gone and gotten the right glove, she would have passed, right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yes. Yep. She just couldn't give another command to heal in on the glove exercise. You cannot reposition after you've pivoted to the glove. Right. All right, you guys that are watching. If you got that all straight, good for you. <laughs> That's one of those, I hope this never happens. Yeah. Well, occasionally you see people do a pivot and the dog turns but doesn't sit. And you've really got to emphasize to them, just send your dog. Don't say sit or straighten them up or anything because it's spelled out in the rules. Any reposition or extra man is a NQ. And the one and only exercise in obedience where a voice and hand is required, you must say, take it on the glove, in addition to give direction. Okay. There was a question that came in about two-word commands. And, and we are seeing people say some things that seem like a double command. They'll say, stand back or lie down. Back. So are there, are there two words that you couldn't put up with, but others that maybe you could? Not specific words. Okay. I, I, you can pretty much say anything you want to constitute a command. But I would say if you're going to use those two word commands, you'd better use them together, not with a, lo a big yeah. delay Make sure between them. Tightly. Like stand, Back is a little bit. You've uncovered the, the third. As opposed to stand back. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay. But if you're delaying in between your words, you're pushing the issue. If you're, if you're giving a command and the dog is halfway to the articles before you s stop saying the command, <laughs> you've got an anticipation. Somebody asked about a small dog and standing with her feet together or in a V or apart when the dog is coming to them. Is there anything about that that seems like maybe more handling than it should be? 
I'm trying to envision what standing with your feet in a V. Well, like your heels are together, but your toes are out. And yeah. the dog is kind of crunchy between it's, your front feet. Yeah. I'd have to look it up, but I'm pretty sure it specifies the dog is not to be sitting between your feet on a front. Okay. So if you if you were standing with your heels together, he still better be far enough away that he's not in between right. you. Yeah. Right. If he wants yeah. to get up under your... Great way to train, but... When you go in the ring, keep your feet together so he can't get in there. <laughs> okay. We are an aging population in this sport, which is wonderful because we're out there being more active than a lot of people our age, right? right. Any, any comments about people with their knees and their hips and, you know, we're back to the changes of pace and noticeable changes of pace. Any hints about that or how you, how you judge that? If I see somebody coming into the ring with a noticeable limp using an appliance to move around, or they mention to me, I've got serious knee problems, which you can usually see the minute they start moving, I will say, just show me the best fast or slow that you can give me. And if it looks like they're really hurting, the back to normal is pretty damn quick. I'm not out there to induce pain all the way across the ring because, you know, they have a bad hip or a bad knee. Or have someone fall. Yeah. That okay. would be even worse. Okay. Just show me a change of pace. It doesn't have to be 30 feet. Just show it to me and we'll get back to the normal pace. Okay. Um, when the judge says exercise finished, is that my cue to move to the next exercise or do I wait for the judge to tell me what the next exercise is? As soon as, you, as the judge says exercise finished, move to where you know you need to be next. Okay. You will probably announce it. <clears throat> We're supposed to. Like after the figure eight, we'll say, okay, command discrimination, but a good handler is already on their way there. Great. Okay. Again, that's part of keeping your dog's attention and keeping a good flow of the whole performance of get there, be ready. This is an interesting one. There was, has been some discussion online about the retrieve on the flat. Can you hold the dumbbell with one hand while giving the stay with the other and then switch hands to throw? It wouldn't bother you. Okay. Nope, I, I don't see any problem. And there. Unless when you were doing it, you juggled it back a little <laughs> bit before you threw it. Okay. No, okay. I, I don't see any issue with that. I mean, there are people who can only throw with one hand. And how about the people that have to throw overhand? Those are pretty odd too, but it happens, right? Okay. <clears throat> All right. You're trying to envision what that looks well, like. Well, since, since the discrimination come on the, on the scene. I changed my state. Okay. And I, I was just trying to envision what I do. And it's, I probably used to be a, a hand switcher. I'm not now because all my stays are with my left hand. So the, the old dumbbells in the hand I'm going to throw with. But I think in prior dogs, I've actually switched hands quite a bit. Uh, yeah. If it's smooth and natural, no reason it should be contested. Okay, one more that I, I know is cause for concern. When a dog is sitting in front, are you looking at their feet or their spine? I'm, I'm standing back far enough that I think I'm just trying to get I'm an overall the, picture. The whole picture. And I can't, you can't always see the feet. You can't always see the spine. I mean, think about a Newfoundland. Right. with all that hair or here's one thing i do I, I i agree with kathy i think we stand back far enough that we're looking at the whole picture and on a front when you're behind them it's it's a little easier to see how straight they are on the finish particularly when you're dealing with fair fairly heavy dogs and it looks straight my second look is at the back feet Okay, if the, if the dog is perfectly straight, those two back feet are usually parallel. If I got a really hairy dog and it might, something's telling me that sit isn't quite right, I'll look down at the back feet and they'll be 
slightly skewed, which means if I got if I had to go around behind him, probably see it. You'd probably see that they were crooked. What we're supposed to judge finishes from the front. Right. One more, and this I should have caught this when we were talking about the new rules for, because of the pandemic. Uh, are the cones where where are the cones for the figure eight typically? Are you, they just putting them somewhere? between the where you would heal and do the retrieve over the high jump or are they just out of the way there's there's been two places in open i've tended to put them back beyond the eight feet mark of the high jump because that's what that's where i used to do figure eights when i when i used people as posts i'd be between the jump and the figure eight so I just set the cones there. I bring them back a little bit so they're not right on top of the jumps. But in a way, it's kind of a channel for the dog. Uh, other times, particularly in novice, you can put the cones closer to the edge of the ring where the leash, chair, rack, whatever is being used. So that when they do exercise, when you do exercise finish on the figure eight, it's kind of step, step, step. They can put the leash fairly close. That so makes sense. I, I've kind of in open done the broad jump is as you're coming the gate the broad jump would be out ahead of you the high jump in the center. I've done my cones between those two. Okay. Running, running, the parallel, running parallel with the uh, broad jump. Running this way instead of this way. Okay. Um, gives everybody plenty of room and they're gonna stay there I'm not moving them between dogs, which we are allowed to do, but that just seems silly to me. Pick a spot, leave them. If you don't mind, before we end tonight, and I, I just can't thank you enough. You guys have been terrific, and I, I've been getting notes that said, oh, tell them they're wonderful. We're having such a good time, so I really appreciate it. Yeah. And wine. <laughs> <laughs> For, somebody wrote in, and I think this is a perfect question to end on. First time novice handler. What advice would you offer them on their obedience journey? You were talking about someone going in beginners for the first time, novice A for the first time. I, I think she's saying <clears throat> that it's, you know, might be beginner novice, might be novice A. Brand new person, what advice would you give them? I'm assuming this is before they venture into the ring and they're learning training techniques and hopefully some good ring handling, sit them just down on the side of the ring and have them with an experienced person watch good and bad handlers in the ring they're going in. So that, you know, we all have a visual or a mental picture of perfection, how we want to look in the ring. That would be a way for them to slowly develop that picture of perfection. Because really, they may be training their dog and they may even be doing a, a really good job, but to watch someone who knows what they're doing in the ring with a really good dog will imprint on their brain and hopefully aspire them to, I want to look like that in the ring too. And also have them watch all levels because I think if they look at utility and set that for their goal, It'll help them on their journey through the, through the whole obedience career. And attitude is everything. You want to make sure that you're dealing with people that have a good attitude and good sportsmanship because it's, it's a fun sport if you keep a good attitude. You, you bet. Listen, I, I just can't thank you enough. And I wish that I could take the time to just go through and read you all the comments that I've gotten, which are thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been great fun. So yep. gang, Really, it, thank you very much for taking time to get together. Everybody's really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to have to say good night. Going to have to say okay. good night to all of you guys too. But really yeah, enjoyed the evening. Thanks, Connie. Thank I you. hope. Enjoy all right. It. I hope we'll see you soon. Okay. okay. Take good care. Good night, everybody. Good night.